It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Mark Yim uh, from UPenn. Uh, Mark is the director of the famed GRASP lab. And uh, you know, in a way that's kind of you know, all, all one needs to say, but of course he has done so much, so much work and so many honors and awards. He's a fellow of our National Academy of Inventors, uh, is known for work on modular robots, but uh, actually far, far ranging work in mechanisms and mechanism design and many other areas of robotics, you know, snake robots, humanoids, self reconfiguring robots. Uh, and uh, we are very happy to have him here today. So Mark, please take it away. Uh, thanks, uh, Mate. It's uh, really nice to be here. Um, I want to uh, uh, also thank you for the opportunity to do this type of talk, which I think is um, different than normal, uh, you know, paper presentations, and is the opportunity to uh, think, talk about things that you wouldn't normally say in a publication, like these are the failures. Uh, these are the types of things I was thinking uh, in the design uh, process. So, so I was actually just thinking about talking about one particular um, experience or one um, device that we've come up with, which is what we call the variable topology truss. Um, I am hoping that we'll have enough time uh, to have questions. I tried to make the talk uh, quick. Um, so uh, prepare your questions and hopefully we'll be able to do something. So uh, this is the goal for what we call the Variable Topology Trust, which is a joint effort between uh, Penn and, uh, and Seoul National University. So this is a simulation that one of the students at Seoul National University came up with. Basically, we wanna make something like this, which is like a variable topology, a variable geometry trust in which the link lengths can change their, uh, their the, mem the trust members can change the length, but also, um, we call it variable topology trust because the topology of the trust system can change as well. All right, so that's the goal. Um, uh, actually, what I wanna do is, is tell you a little bit about what I was thinking as we were um, developing this, how we came up with the idea. And actually it started with a student who, who, who said, you know, uh, prismatic joints are, seem like they could be really useful if you had a really good one. We, we look at all these, um, uh, we look at all the robots these days, they all have articulated joints. How come we don't have any good prismatic joints? And this is where um, we, I, we started brainstorming. How can we have a good prismatic joint? And I started playing around with paper. So normally when you design things, you, you do whatever you can quickly with what's available and paper's really useful. So I started playing around, this is just a manila folder. I, this is the actual first thing I made. I, I cut this little sheet of uh, manila folder and put a little slits in there. And I was thinking if we could have the edges kind of lock into each other, you can start to form a tube that could be kind of strong, you know, as you put it together and it, it, it kind of works. So the next step was to, to make something a little bit more sophisticated to laser cut a sheet that had kind of saw teeth in it. And, and there's like little slots for the teeth to come into and you can just get it to a zipper together essentially. So this is taped at the bottom and taped at the top, but not anywhere else. And it turned out to make a tube that is really strong, even though it's just paper thin. There's, there's, it engages and it and holds really well. So like, okay, this is great. Um, we might actually be able to uh, make something that works, um, that could be kind of a um, start as a uh, kind of like a toilet paper tube, but then could expand and, and grow into a spiral or helix. Um, and so the next step is, you know, get a student to work on it. Um, so I, I had an undergraduate, a very talented undergraduate, who came up with this idea. I mean, who actually put it together, uh, which was, you know, you can see here, it's, you start out with a band that's um, wrapped up, but then could also be uh, the zippered on the top edge to the bottom edge to form a tube and spirals out. And we can actually get very large extension ratios. This thing actually goes all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, so, you know, that's, this is great. Um, we, maybe we can do things with it. And then I saw this video. So this is uh, something that from NASA Goddard from uh, 15 years ago, uh, which is, you know, it's a conception video. And you look at this thing and, and it's walking around and, and uh, you know, even it's like extreme locomotion, it can chimney up these, these walls. And even if it gets far apart, uh, it can still reach out and do these things. And of course, this is all simulation. But yeah, it's pretty compelling, this, this simulation. Uh, and, uh, 
in terms of uh, mobility, I, you know, it's, I haven't seen anything that I couldn't conceive of anything that could have this type of mobility that could roll around, but also if it comes up to a big cliff or a chasm, it could, you know, span that chasm, it could reach out and grab the other side. Of course, one part of this is how far can it reach? That's a, a big part of it. And, and so, okay, wow, that, that, that's, that's kind of crazy. Um, can you actually do that? So I started thinking about, can we do that? What would it take to do that? And basically it's a truss that has uh, members that can change the length and you need to have this high expansion ratio, which is paper uh, thing that I came up before, the spiral zipper, you know, that it could do that. Um, so that's a good part. We have the truss members, but they also, they're also the nodes, the nodes where the members join together. So in order to, uh, trusses generally have um, systems where you don't want to have any moments that are transferred between the members. So you need to have spherical joints. We'd like the node to have arbitrary degrees. So it's not fixed in the number of, you know, three members out of the node. It could have maybe six, seven, eight members. So um, if you can make them chainable, you can have, it's extendable. You can have as many as you like. Um, and also uh, as a general principle, you wanna make things as simple as possible. You wanna minimize any extra actuation. So you don't wanna make them add extra motors and things. Turns out that Art Sanderson and Greg Hamlin did uh, something very similar called Tetrabot, which um, it took a while for me to find, to remember that they did that. Um, so this is for the node part, one of the things that we came up with, which is uh, essentially spherical linkage. So this, the spherical linkage is just two uh, linkages that are kind of curved along sphere arcs of, of circles. And uh, what it does is it constrains the ends to meet at a point, but allows the two degrees of rotational freedom for uh, any point. So what chainable means is that you can take, you have a chain of them, but there's always an endpoint where you can add on another one, or this is the endpoint of, of one, and you can uh, oops, you can take out that, you know, take out or add together an arbitrary number of these guys um, because they, they chain. All right, so as I started to put these things together, I was thinking, wow, this is going to be really hard. Um, if we look at the video, they have really large extension ratios, and maybe a, a hundred to one. When I was crossing that chasm, it could have been a thousand to one. Uh, as they uh, move around, the angles between two members gets really small, probably less than five degrees. Um, and as it walks around, the, these bars are, it's a simulation. It's very likely they ignore the fact that they're probably colliding. So um, when we started thinking about, okay, how would you actually do this? The software is actually really hard. How do you, you know, there's at least 18 members here. Um, how do you, this eight dimensional space, how do you keep them from, how do you plan in that space is really hard. We ended up not using that uh, uh, spherical linkage that I proposed earlier. Uh, the, this is closer to the, um, the Tetrabot version, which could only get to about 20 degrees. And even that is hard. We've got an expansion ratio of about 45 to one, um, which is not bad. But you know it's not 100 to one, and, and uh, more would be even better. Um, at this time, we 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 started coming up with uh, uh, there were proposals, calls for proposals coming out, and so as a professor or researcher, you start thinking about well, how can I get this funded? And uh, search and rescue is one of the things that people often talk about. So we're thinking, okay, search and rescue is one of the applications that we can use for this. Um, and then uh, if you have a search and rescue, you might have like a a structure, a shelter that would be useful but for a trust-like system, but it could also be a bridge, like a trust bridge or, or a, 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 an antenna or that type of thing. And if we could have a system that could, you know, reconfigure itself because these are different topologies, you know, wouldn't that be great? And I was thinking, well, this thing is really hard um, to, to make. And then, well, you know, making it reconfigure, that's because it's chainable. We can actually do that. They can, the nodes can reconfigure um, but that's really hard. It's, it's even harder, uh, but you know, you don't want to do things that are uh, incremental. This is what, 6-1, uh, transformation, all those buzzwords. Uh, so let's do something that's really hard. And then, and then uh, another thing, idea popped into my mind that, okay, Church and Rescue, I, I had done some work with firefighters before and, and shoring a building is what they often do. They have to put together these wooden structures in the buildings if it's, if it's damaged and they fall down. And that's really hard. They have to bring the wood and, and develop the thing outside the building as they put it together. Wouldn't it be great if the robot could do that? But to do that, the robot would have to support between 1,000 to 4,000 pounds. So you need to have this thing strong enough to hold up a building. 
okay, it was really hard to do before, but eh, you know, it's already impossible. Let's just make it super strong as well. And it turns out that it's not completely crazy because the tube structures are almost optimal in terms of strength to weight ratio. They're very good at compression. We were able to get th um, the plastic bands to support 300 pounds. You could stand on it, and, it, and even with the thin plastic. Um, we were doing some experiments with steel bands, and we're pretty sure they can do over a thousand uh, as well, even when they get longer. So one of the things people often ask is, I mean, that this, this reconfiguration part is kind of confusing. But how does that work? There's a process we call uh, merging and splitting. If you take two nodes, those two nodes can join together and then split apart in a different way. And that's how you can get from this configuration to that configuration. This video actually shows it a little bit better. So this node here at the top is going to split. And one of the things you might want it to do is get to the other side of that bar so you can you know, that's how you can do some reconfiguration. Or this one is splitting in two different ways. The, that process of merging and splitting is um, one way that you can form these different configurations. And when you start thinking about the theory of these things, this is where it gets kind of interesting. There's something one of my students came up with, which we call this uh, topology neighbor graph. This represents this particular configuration, this particular dot on this graph. If you do a merge of two nodes, you end up with another uh, connected dot on the graph. And then if it splits in a different way, you end up with each one of these is a different dot is a different configuration. So um, these are the you know seven different possibly useful configurations, something like a tent or a cube, or but this one has like four appendages, you know, that might, might be useful to have like a quadruped type configuration. You can look at see which configuration can be uh, connected to another one and what steps needs to happen, merging and splitting to get there. And you can do an analysis. And it turns out if you do the analysis, we for this particular set, we realize that the quadruped is not connected. You, you cannot go from this guy in terms of merging and splitting to get to the quadruped. So there's some interesting topo topological analysis you can do. Um, the actual uh, merging for the hardware is shown here. Um, so this is again the, that uh, uh, the node of one truss end and then uh, the, uh, potentially another one, and they merge together by docking. And so this now chain of uh, spherical linkages are are shown there. And then they would actually latch. This is a little latching mechanism that would come in and dock. So it would come in and dock. And, and Alexander here is showing how the, the that this particular linkage moves in terms of the spherical linkage. Uh, so it's a little bit cumbersome and, and um, slightly difficult to do. Um, so uh, this is what our latest just before COVID hit in, in the lab, uh, showing a, an octahedron that we ultimately would really get to to do locomotion. And um, one of the things is that you know as you're doing experiments, this is the type of thing you don't actually put in the paper, but failures occur. There's you know it's not good. It's not what we wanted, but uh, the spiral zipper occasionally um, does uh, break. Uh, actually, it breaks a lot. Um, so failures are, is, are good. I tell students, you know, you learn a lot. So we don't call them failures, we call them stepping stones. You, you do these failures so you learn. Um, and one of the things we found out that the, the, here, this is supported by cables, the cable's about to break. When the cable breaks, you get kind of a catastrophic failure. Um, the bands are uh, uh, a little bit dangerous when they break, especially if you made them out of steel, sheet steel, thin sheet steel that, spring steel that, you know, when it, this is also bad. Um, here that we had some kind of closed loop control um, that uh, went a little bit awry. Um, and when the, uh, if it was the steel version, you know, flying thin steel is, is, is not fun. Um, so anyway, um, this is, these are the team. Uh, I want to leave some time for questions. These are uh, the team that we currently have uh, that have been working on it both at Seoul National University uh, and, and at Penn. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, most exciting about this particular work, so this is, a, again, like kind of a work in progress, uh, uh, being able to talk about a project here and, and how we were thinking and, and failing uh, is kind of fun um, without having to say in the paper, regular paper, these are all the things that work because that's all you talk about in the real paper. Uh, so hopefully, um, if you've got questions, we can do, uh, we've got time for questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, please type questions in the Q&A, folks, or the other panelists in the chat. We have a question in the chat window to begin with. Do you have a model for the paper zipper, meaning a deformation model as a function of external forces or parameters? 
the, the panelist is saying, I have built a parallel robot using toilet paper rolls as actuators, and I'm looking for this kind of model. <laughs> um, so I do, we do not have a, a model. We don't think about um, when we've got the, the tubes, we haven't looked at the, the deformation, especially axial deformation. Um, we, uh, so far, we've just been thinking, looking at things like Euler buckling, assuming that you have a, a boom, a beam, you know, what are the maximum stresses um, where it starts to fail. Um, uh, but yeah, no, we don't have that. I, I, if you do have, I would love to see a, a toilet paper uh, robot. Those types of things are always fun. So that, the que that question was from Jean-Pierre Merlet, the, our, our oh, previous okay. speaker. So maybe you know you, can, you guys can connect. Any any other questions for for Mark? We have a question in the Q and A. Uh, is a question is okay. We, okay. Uh, how is the extending tube different from a spiral lift actuator? Yeah. So that's a great question. The spiral lift actuator actually uses two. Um, spiral lift, for those who don't know, is, is a commercial company, which is it's pretty cool. They have this thing where they lift up stages, so it's very, very strong. It's metal, but they have uh, a band, and then they have an extra uh, thing that that locks in the band. Um, it, so there's two parts. It's not just a band. It's, it, there's another band that comes in and locks it together. So it's much stronger, much more expensive, much heavier. Part of the thing is uh, that uh, we're trying to do is make something very, very simple and low cost. Um, so that's where we're going with that. Got it. Uh, as, as we have more questions coming in, I was, uh, so we have one more question in the Q&A. Uh, are there applications for odd topologies or very reconfigurable systems in human machine interaction? I'm fascinated by the idea of assembling objects around people. Yes, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, because we have, uh, in all of these systems, typically the ones that we're doing with the variable topology trust, very high degrees of freedom. Uh, so they, if you wanted to, you could have uh, like a trust system, you know, 18, 20 degrees of freedom around a person and, you know, whatever the person does, however he wants to move, you can apply forces to that person but, or vice versa. The person can push on the object. Um, so yeah, that, that's actually very, very interesting. Um, actually, I'm doing a little bit of work with uh, Alice Nokomura and they have this project these vine robots, which are again kind of similar in the sense of them uh, extending. I know Nathan Yusevich was, I don't know if he's still here, um, working on a similar uh, robot as well. Those are soft in addition to being prismatic joints. So uh, that types of interaction with people is kind of a natural thing. We, we, it is interesting to see if we're going to see more prismatic joints take over, like you were talking at the beginning of your talk between you know, the spiral, the zipper, the vine robot. A few months ago, we had uh, the Hello Robot. You probably noticed that Aaron Edzinger and Charlie Kemp's company, Hello Robot, they came out with their robot, which has a prismatic joint, which is kind of concentric tubes, but it just makes so much sense. So do you think we're gonna see more and more prismatic joints just show up in practice? So I believe so, personally. I think, so one of the things with robot arms, I, I make this pitch that um, I, I don't like elbows in robot arms. I don't know if you've seen me talks before, but uh, essentially, if you don't have elbows, if you have these prismatic joints, there are lots of advantages to that. It's typically more difficult to do, um, uh, typically more expensive, but if um, you don't have to worry about, you know, elbows running into things. You don't need this extra seven degrees of freedom arm because the elbow's in the way. Um, so you can reduce the number of degrees of freedom. You can get uh, lower costs. You don't have, there are a variety of reasons. So I, I think it would be great if that does happen. So then one last question we can address live, any resources on prismatic joints for the hobbyist that you can recommend? Um, there are, there are they're actually it's difficult. Um, most commercially available prismatic joints are um, expensive. Uh, so, um, but there are a lot of them out there, you know, and usually they have expense uh, ratios, compression expansion ratios of, of you know, less than one, two to one, because usually it's, you know, a telescoping thing. Um, uh, so I actually don't know, if anyone knows, you know, I would love to hear of, of uh, other low cost ways to do things like that for hobbyists. Okay, thank you, Mark. Have a round of applause, a worldwide round of applause. <laughs> uh,